Good evening. My name is Joy Collenberg Fallon. I'm president of the Radcliffe College Alumni Association, and on behalf of the RCAA, the Institute of Politics, and the Kennedy School Women's uh, Conference, I want to welcome you here this evening. The panel is going to be on an interesting topic for all of us, finding a voice of one's own, lessons for tomorrow's leaders. I want to give special thanks for tonight to the Radcliffe College Alumni Association Undergraduate Relations Committee, chaired by Eleanor White. I want to thank also Mary Carty and Amy Sandler, without whose excellent work tonight we would not have this excellent, excellent program. I've been asked to very briefly cover for you three issues. First, the Radcliffe College Alumni Association is made up of 26,000 women alums who have attended Radcliffe and Harvard. We're committed to programming for women alumni on issues of importance to women. We're also dedicated to being a voice for the women undergraduates here at Harvard and Radcliffe, a group about whom we care deeply. To give you a flavor for some of our events, I wanted to share with you three that are coming up in April. Our recent graduates com uh, committee that meets in Washington, D.C., is going to be uh, talking with Surgeon General Jocelyn Elders this month. In Los Angeles, we're going to have a conference for all generations of Radcliffe alums regarding the topic of violence. And here in Cambridge in April, we're going to be having a conference for our older alumni, uh, an annual conference for women over 50, and Betty Friedan will be the keynote speaker. That just gives you a taste of some of the activities of the Radcliffe College Alumni Association. It's a great group of women. We hope uh, that those of you who are alumni will join us. Secondly, I want to just tell you about the Women's Leadership Conference. I hope for those of you who are undergraduates, tonight's activity will really whet your appetite and have you consider participating in what is now the seventh annual Women's Leadership Conference. The conference is held each fall, the week before classes begin, and the upcoming fall will be September 9th through 14th. And it is a conference which is uh, one to which you apply. Applications are currently available in all the school libraries, in the Lyman Common Room at Radcliffe and in the Radcliffe Dean of Students Office. It is a conference sponsored by Radcliffe College and the Institute of Politics, and students who've participated say it really has been a life-transforming experience. Um, Holly Levine, hey, Hallie Levine, who is with us today, uh, right here, is on the board and can answer questions if any of you are interested as undergraduates, and the conference is open to men and women. Um, finally, I wanted to introduce to you our uh, moderator for this evening. Uh, Dr. Linda Moore uh, is uh, someone with whom I've had the pleasure of working at Radcliffe. She is tonight's uh, moderator and is also the acting director of the new Radcliffe Public Policy Institute. Under her guidance, the Radcliffe Institute is focusing on a number of issues, including women work in the economy and also those related to women's leadership. Dr. Moore is also an associate professor of management at Simmons College, where she teaches a number of courses, including managing a pluralistic workforce, which is a course she designed and is now required for all management majors there. Dr. Moore has written and consulted extensively in the area of diversity and strategic management. Her clients have included Travelers Insurance Company, John Hancock Insurance, Polaroid Digital, AT&T, and many others. Um, she also has recently written an interesting article that was published in Ms. Magazine, uh, November edition in, of 92, entitled The Technicolor Workplace. There she recognizes that women are by no means monolithic, um, and with that background, I think she's an excellent person to lead tonight's discussion on each of us finding our own voices in leadership. Thank you. Thank you, Joyce. Well, good evening. Can you hear me? Yes. Welcome. We are uh, gathered here tonight to explore the topic of uh, finding a voice of one's own, lessons for tomorrow's leaders. The purpose of this uh, forum is to address the needs for information and advice on career paths of leaders. Uh, we want to address the various ways in which leaders develop and the variety of tools and techniques, both the art and the science, uh, of uh, becoming a leader and being an effective leader. We have five very accomplished and articulate women with us tonight uh, who come from uh, a variety of sectors, backgrounds, uh, situations themselves, um, both in the uh, not-for-profit and not-for-profit organizations, in elected and appointed office, and in the world of uh, journalism. They are diverse as individuals and as women, 
um, and yet they have the common bond of being leaders in their own right. We've asked them to address their personal experiences in becoming leaders, as well as uh, some of the methodologies, the tools that they have found most helpful to them in, in becoming effective leaders. Um, I have given them strict instructions that they will speak for only about 10 minutes each initially, and I get to, I know it's tough, um, uh, and I get to sort of uh, be timekeeper here, and I will keep them to it because my format here is to let them each speak. I will ask you to hold questions until the end of the last person's talk, uh, and then we will open it up to the audience and have plenty of time for, uh, I hope, a lot of stimulating discussion, uh, questions and answers. Let me briefly introduce a little bit more uh, our speakers in the order in which they'll be speaking tonight. Kim Campbell, on the end of our, um, uh, to my right, is, uh, has started as a university professor in the Soviet studies area. Um, she has been a lawyer. She has served at three levels of government, uh, municipal, uh, municipal, provincial, and of course the national le level. She was uh, elected uh, leader of the Progressive Conservative Party of Canada uh, in 1993 and was Canada's 19th Prime Minister. She is also currently a fellow at the Institute of Politics. Um, seated next to Kim is Loretta McLaughlin. She is a um, soon-to-be fellow of the Radcliffe Public Policy Institute, I'm happy to announce, and of Harvard's AIDS Institute. Um, she has uh, been a regular op-ed columnist for the Boston Globe on the continuing evolution of national health care reform in particular. She did serve uh, from 1992 to 94 as the editorial page director of the Globe and for six years prior to that as associate editorial page editor. She has covered major developments in medicine, science, medical economics, and world demographics. Um, she has also won a number of journalism awards and twice received editorial commendations by the New England Journal of Medicine. Immediately to my right is Priscilla Douglas. Uh, Priscilla was appointed Secretary of Consumer Affairs for the Commonwealth uh, in August 93. Um, her present responsibilities include oversight of the Division of Banks, the Division of Insurance, the Department of Public Utilities, Alcohol Beverages Control Commission, Division of Registration, <laughs> Board of Registration and Medicine, what am I missing, Cable Commission and the Racing Commission. She is, uh, prior to that, she served as Assistant Secretary of Administration and Finance, uh, responsible for the Minority Business Enterprise, uh, the Massachusetts Commission Against Discrimination, and the State Office of Affirmative Action. She uh, is currently also teaching at the uh, Radcliffe Seminars, teaching courses in women, public policy, and state leadership. To my left, we have Sonia Jarvis, who is the executive director of the National Coalition on Black Voter Participation. She was appointed executive director of the National Coalition in September 1987. Um, she previously worked as an associate general counsel for the National Security Archive, which negotiates with federal agencies for the release of information pertaining to national security and foreign policy. As executive director, she regularly works with national organizations on issues such as civic participation, voting rights, education, women's rights, international electoral reform, and civil rights. She was the fall 1993 visiting Lombard lecturer here at the Sharon, uh, the Sharon, Sharon, yeah, Sharon <laughs> Center, thank you, Barone <laughs> Center on Press and Politics. She is also currently, in her spare time, pulling together books on a book on race and politics, and one on examining the cultural divide between Africans and African Americans. And last of all, but certainly not least, Kate Michaelman, who is president of the National Abortion and Reproductive Rights Action League. She has led the National Abortion and Reproductive Rights Action League since 1985, becoming the leading voice for choice in America and making it the uh, powerful political arm of the pro-choice movement. Uh, during her tenure, it increased its national membership to three quarters of a million, building a grassroots movement that developed an impressive track record, electing pro-choice candidates and, de and defeating anti-choice legislation. Um, she was a chief ar architect of the um, Who Decides message that redefined the national debate on reproductive choice in 1989. 
In recent months, she's been working with the board of directors to expand their mission to reflect the full pro-choice agenda. Um, and she is currently a fellow here at the Institute of Politics. With those in brief introductions in mind, I'd like to begin by asking Kim to address our topic for tonight. Well, thank you very much. I've <clears throat> done what I used to do when I taught, which take my, is take my watch off. But invariably, my lectures would be ended by the bell, so I expect to get a time <laughs> signal. I try to follow this, uh, this guide. It's interesting to be here this evening and trying to think of what I can say that would be helpful to young women who are thinking of perhaps going into careers in politics. Because in the course of my adult lifetime, the circumstances have changed rather dramatically. And the kinds of situations that I found myself in at your particular stage in life no longer, uh, no longer pertain. And I think that's a good thing. So I'd like to start just by saying a few little things about um, how I got to be where I am uh, and some of my observations about the challenges facing women who wish to rise in public life or in the professions in the last few years. First of all, I, um, isn't it, I'm, I'm working on a book on my life in Ottawa while I'm here. And in, in my mind, the working title is, What's a Nice Girl Like You Doing in a Place Like This? <laughs> because um, it's, I certainly didn't get there through any uh, carefully thought out plan. I think one of the things that's most characteristic of women who find themselves at the heads of large organizations or in senior positions in public life is very few of them have followed a carefully mapped out career plan. Uh, more of the men I know who've uh, come to senior positions in the professions in public life have followed a career plan. And that is because for them, there was a path that you could follow. When I was a young woman, I graduated from high school in 1964. Uh, there were very few women in public life in my country. And if you talked about it as an aspiration, in fact, I didn't want to be Prime Minister of Canada. I wanted to be the first woman Secretary General of the UN. And I met Mr. Boutrous Galley recently, and I thought, phew, that was a close escape, because <laughs> <laughs> being Prime Minister is frustrating. Um, I was the first girl to be the student council president of my high school, 1963-64. Uh, in its 43-year history. I was the first woman to be president of the freshman class. Um, I went on to study political science and to have a, a, an academic career and then to go into law uh, because I felt that although in the long run I might want to go into public life, I wasn't really sure uh, how I would do it. I didn't belong to a political party. My campus politics were not partisan politics. They were sort of the student activity type mm -hmm. politics. And it wasn't obvious to me uh, how to get involved. Um, also, I felt I wanted to know something, and I think that is the first piece of advice I would give to anyone who wants to go into public life, and that is take the opportunity to nourish your mind. There are people who go into public life very young. I think they never really grow in the same way as people who have some kind of professional accreditation or accomplishment and some working experience mm. uh, under their belt. Also, it's very important if you go into public life to always be in a position where you can turn your back on it if you have to. The only way you can live consistently with your own principles and to keep the sense of integrity that makes it meaningful and rewarding to you is to have something else you can do. I'm a member of the British Columbia Bar. I'm also a member of the Ontario Bar now because having been our Attorney General, I was called to the bar there. I keep my practice certificate current. I haven't practiced law since 1985, but it's very important for me to know, and always was important for me to know there was something else that I could do. When I was... Um, a younger woman and with an academic life uh, and in the, my, my life in the law, women succeeded. Women were recognized to the extent that they could be ersatz men. The standards by which we were judged were male standards. And if I had a dollar for everyone who told me that I was the smartest girl they ever met, or gee, I was sure smart for a girl, I'd be a wealthy woman. And I must say, it, was, it wasn't until I was in my early 20s that I really understood that that was not a compliment because uh, you know, there's plenty more where I came from. Uh, the world is full of intelligent and able women. But when I was growing up, intelligent women or women who showed some, some promise of doing things outside the traditional female roles were often hived off. And we also got into tokenism. Tokenism breeds competition. Equality breeds collegiality. And one of the reasons why women have not always supported other women is that in many areas of life, there was only room for one woman. If you're in a law firm, there's only going to be one woman partner or two women partners. The other women in your firm are your direct uh, competitors. These are not people that you feel comfortable forming alliances with. You do not feel that, I mean, that, that, that you want to make them look good, because there's a, there's a limited number of opportunities. 
as opportunities for women have opened up, as we've, as we've begun to get away from the concept of tokenism, I mean, women are 51% of the Canadian population. It is inconceivable that one woman can represent all Canadian women. It's just not possible. Uh, we do not march in ideological lockstep. We are not clones of one another. We are as varied as our male counterparts. And therefore, it's, it's simply unacceptable that having one woman on a board or one woman uh, or, or even a couple of women uh, in a particular decision-making authority is enough. There have to be more because we have to be representing all our diversity. But as we've seen those opportunities grow, I've seen two things. One a greater willingness of women to support other women. And I think this has been evident in public life in my country very much over the last few years. And when I became Prime Minister of Canada, actually even when I became Justice Minister, I was the first woman to be Justice Minister. It's a very, very powerful position in the Canadian government. And the sense of excitement that I felt in women across the country was really something. They felt so validated, very, very supportive. And the same thing when I became Prime Minister, even though I only served for a short period of time. It meant a lot to Canadian women that that barrier had been broken. We can get into a discussion later about how, how permanently it's been broken. It's not, there's still a lot, a lot of, uh, of difficulties there. But so I noticed a growing collegiality. The other thing I noticed was that as women became more numerous in public life and in the professions, they began to push against the barriers that had been put around their role and to resist participating as ersatz men and to insist more and more in speaking in their own voices, in speaking as women, in looking like women, in talking like women, and in articulating the reality of life as it is lived by women. And that hasn't always been easy, and it's reflected in things like development of maternity leave programs in, in, in law firms. But in public life, I think it's been very important to see that change. And today in my study group, I was talking about uh, the, uh, the rape shield legislation that I brought in to amend the Canadian Criminal Code when I was Justice Minister, and how extraordinary it was for me to see when the legislation was being debated in the House of Commons, men standing up in the House of Commons and giving very sensitive, very enlightened speeches in support of the legislation, talking about sexual assault and what it meant to Canadian women and how important it was to have this legislation. And that, that only comes when women speak in their own voices. I can remember in cabinet discussions on the issue of abortion and talking very, very candidly about the reality of birth control in the night, what was then the late 1980s. And the fact there is no safe, effective, universally available method of birth control that all women can use. And how many of my colleagues, male colleagues, came up to me after and said, thank you. Thank you for speaking so honestly. Because if you don't talk honestly, they don't know. It isn't just always a conspiracy when people don't understand the way women see things. And so my goal in public life became to ensure that the reality of life, as it is lived by women, as it is experienced by women, would be one of the fundamental assumptions on which public policy was built. In order to do that, it meant we had to reach out and encompass the reality of a great many women. As a minister, I spoke to many women whose lives were very, very different from my own. I could not, in my own life, encompass all of their experiences. And I learned and I grew, but to me, the presence of women in public life is fundamentally a question of democracy, the true enfranchisement of women, that women experience the world differently from men. And the only way you can have a true democracy, true representation of the people who live in any society is when that reality is articulated. And I think in the course of my adult lifetime, I've seen enormous changes, and I've seen a growing willingness of women to speak in their own voices. We have to find our own ways of doing things because many of the traditional mechanisms of political advancement don't exist for us. And we'll talk about this later, and many of you may have questions. I might point out that today I have worn slacks here, I think for the first time since I came, because I was in a forum here when we came, uh, the, the fellows of the IOP sat here. And I don't happen to have any long skirts with me. One of the things that I don't like as a woman is sitting in a short skirt in an audience like this. There are a myriad ways in which the world has been designed to meet the reality of men. And where arrangements are made, the, the leader, first leadership debate, uh, the first uh, debate in the leadership campaign that I ultimately won, I was criticized for not doing very well. What happened was, and I, I wasn't as well prepared as I should have been, but I was the only one of the candidates who stood in one place for two hours in a pair of high-heeled shoes. Mm. I didn't make that mistake again. <laughs> so there are a whole number of ways, both cosmic and small, in which women 
have to seize uh, their place in society. Uh, and I can tell you that um, there is an enormous amount that you can accomplish just by being there. I would just conclude by saying that I think one of the barriers that women have faced is that most people are imprinted on a certain vision of people who hold certain positions as being men. When I became Minister of Justice, there was a photo gallery in the anteroom to my office of every Minister of Justice since Canadian Confederation. And none of them looked like me because I was the first woman. By the time I left that portfolio almost three years later, I had become identified with the position. I was what a Minister of Justice looked like. And I think we have to break down this expectation that the President, that the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, that governors, that legislators are men in three-piece suits, slightly graying at the temple. And you notice how they always seem to be so assertive and confident. Mm -hmm. um, that, that is one physiognomy that fits those roles, but that the people who can do those jobs come in a lot of different sizes, shapes, colors, timbre of voice, and approach to things. And that, I think, is the challenge that your generation is really going to have to realize. Thank you. Thank you. I can see you're well trained. I didn't even have to give you a two-minute warning. <laughs> OK, next, Loretta McLaughlin. I think uh, my story is somewhat the same and yet quite different from that of Kim's. I think part of it is uh, uh, a difference in age. Part of it is the difference in our cultures. I started earlier, and it was harder. My first job in a Boston newspaper began in 1950. Now, that may seem like a long time ago, but actually it's only a very short time ago. And yet the world was so enormously different. Uh, we, I was not the first woman to work for Boston Paper or anything like it. But uh, looking at it backward now, I see the women I worked with in those early years. We became what I see now as the hinge generation. There may have been a woman or two on each newspaper, on most newspapers. But we were the first generation of women who married, who had children, who kept on working, and who opened that door wide. When I started, I used to say, well, you know, we may be able to become privates, but not sergeants. So now you can become a captain, but there are damn few generals even today. Uh, I think that. Um, you have to understand in the 1950s uh, that newspapers, well, they still are classified as factories. And the state law, and I believe the federal law, said that at that time that you couldn't work past the fifth, fifth month of pregnancy in a factory. So of course what we did was not tell anyone we were pregnant and worked uh, until uh, we were well into the eighth month or so wearing very tight girdles and doing a lot of other things that probably weren't, weren't very good for us or the baby. But the kids turned out OK anyway. <laughs> <laughs> there was a, a generally accepted practice that if you had one or two women on the news side, we, we wrote mostly, uh, many wrote feature stories. I particularly enjoyed working for William Randolph Hearst on a tabloid paper because that was the best job a woman reporter could have. There was much less difference drawn between men and women on the tabloid press than on the prestigious press, where women were given no chance. The New York Times, after all, is the newspaper in this country that was sued for prejudice and discrimination, overt discrimination against women. Now at this elderly phase in my life, I can understand what, what, what it is. It is the higher, the loftier the institution, the greater the discrimination. Because, <laughs> because those are the places where great power is vested and where men have had privilege uh, and advantage the longest. And you know uh, they uh, uh, do not give it up easily. I think that, uh, as Kim says, we've come a long way, baby. Uh, I remember going to here at Harvard in the, um, uh, the cage, the baseball cage, 
uh, Richard Nixon was coming to speak. It would have been the second Eisenhower campaign. He was vice president. And 5,000 Republican men of New England were gathering there. And I went over, you know, in my naive way, uh, representing the old Boston Evening American. And we all stood around in the press room and we were all kibitzing and so forth and never really noticed one way or the other until it was finally time to go in. And this guard said, you can't go in there. And I said, why not? And he said, because you're a woman. And only men were going to be admitted. And men who were uh, colleagues at the time just sort of pushed me right on through and said to this guy, uh, but she's not a woman, she's a newspaper man. <laughs> <laughs> and it was all very friendly, and of course it worked, and we all got in. But I must tell you that at the same time, it was not a sense of fair play. It was sort of like a mascot. We were these cute little girls who were out you know, playing at being in the newspaper business. But as I say, we persisted. We got pregnant. We worked. We came back to work. I remember colleagues saying to me, how was I going to feel when my children grew up to be juvenile delinquents? <laughs> well, you know, happily I tell you, more of theirs are than mine. <laughs> uh, I think, um, how, do you, how do you move from that point where you're a line reporter one, one in the pack, to the point where you begin to move up in management, and that is very difficult in the newspaper business for anyone. There is no clear-cut ladder of advancement. It's a business for prima donnas. Uh, the bigger the newspaper, the harder it is. There still is a great role for connections and uh, uh, family loyalties. I think that any woman, even now, who expects to rise in the ranks of the newspaper industry is going to have to be awfully good, very hardworking, and absolutely unswervable. Uh, I loved it. For me, it was really not hard work. I, there wasn't anything else I wanted to do more than to go to work. I went whistling, singing every day. I still love it. Uh, I think that you have to be extremely generous. You have to do your, your own job, and you have to do as much as you can to help other people around you do theirs. I don't think that it's a place for small resentments, uh, peevishness, and I don't think you can play any kind of uh, games of, of politics in-house. You may get some small advancement, but you will not stay on the track. I think also that at some point you have to just plow ahead. You have to start trying for all the jobs, all the openings, take advantage. I know that when I was moved into the editorial pages at the Boston Globe, we had just, you know, we had, I'd been on a, a, a very successful ride as a medical news writer. We had done the mystery diseases of Legionnaire's disease. We did the baboon heart babies out in Loma Linda. We had Nagasaki's disease here. We had toxic shock syndrome, and along came AIDS. And it wasn't just prejudice against homosexuals that kept stories to a minimum. It was a fatigue on the part of editors with mystery diseases that stopped being mysteries in fairly short order. I was one of a handful, fewer than five re medical news writers in this country that sensed as much as really knew that AIDS would be a major d disaster of a disease as it is, and will continue to be, by the way, through your adult life. And um, so at any rate, we had also done that. This opportunity came to go into the editorial pages, and I certainly seized it. Uh, it was time to move away from just writing news stories. And also, I had acquired so much more experience than even I realized. 
I had covered politics. I covered five alarm fires, but I also covered presidential campaigns. I had covered medicine and science. And that kind of newspaper work had made me a stickler for precision. And I wish there were even more precision in the newspaper reporting today. I would like to say that I really believe that the big battles have been won. And I might have even come here and said that tonight, except for an experience that I had today. <laughs> now that I am retiring and have so much free time, which I am not retiring and I have very little free time, everyone is asking me to be on boards and give speeches and be an advisor to them. So I'm not going to tell you which one, because I'm not here to, uh, to, to put the finger on anybody. But I'd been asked to become a member of a board of overseers of a major medical facility in this area. And I went to the first meeting today. Combination board of trustees of the foundation of the medical facility and the new board of overseers. And do you know that of 35 people in the room, I was the only woman? Not only that, there wasn't, there were only Caucasian faces in the room. So I said, gee, where have we all been? How come I didn't know this? I was a reporter for a major metropolitan newspaper, a major medical writer, and here within a stone's throw are facilities where there's still no women on the board. I, I don't know whether it's a compliment or not, to be honest with you whether they think I'm easy and won't make them trouble for them, or what, what the story is, I don't think so. And I think that is my real message tonight. The movie Philadelphia, uh, which I was part of a group that helped sponsor a premiere of this movie as an AIDS benefit, uh, is not really about discrimination against a person with AIDS. It's about discrimination. And the scene in the movie that struck, you know, in my heart was the scene where the men executives of the major law firms and the major uh, uh, businesses in a major city are gathered in a steam room. And of course, that's the most exclusive club in the world. All the money and all the power and all the boys stripped down <laughs> so they can really, you know, be bonded together. <laughs> and the joke goes like this. What do you call a woman who suffers from PMS, PMT, premenstrual tension, and ESP at the same time? Because the answer is a bitch who thinks she knows everything. And of course, the next scene is the same people, only they're in a boardroom. And they are protesting how, with, how could anyone possibly think that they would entertain a, a prejudiced thought mm -hmm. or discriminate against anyone. And so my message is, we've come a long way, baby. But until you're in the boardroom, there's not really going to be equal employment and justice, economic justice for women. Thank you. Thank you very much. Priscilla. Can I stand up? Okay. Um, I stand before you as the first uh, African-American woman to serve in the Weld Salucci cabinet. And I'm certainly not the first African-American woman to have the ability to do so. But I am the first one to have the opportunity. And again, that speaks to the point in terms of the fact, are we still breaking down barriers? Yes, we are. And there are many others, many more barriers to, to break down. In terms of my background, I grew up in Bedford, Massachusetts on a pig farm. 
We were the only black family in the town. I grew up with five brothers and I'm the youngest. So needless to say, men and being involved in boy things and men things has been very much a part of my life. Uh, I uh, went to Girl State in uh, 1964. Kevin White was the Secretary of State and, uh, at that time. In 1981, I was selected to be a White House Fellow and I served as special assistant to William Webster at the FBI. I was the first African-American woman to be a special assistant to a director of the FBI. And when you think about, think about that, the first African-American woman to sit on what they called mahogany row. I worked on issues at the FBI that had to do with um, parity, um, uh, equity for women. One of the things that uh, William Webster wanted to do was to increase the number of women and minorities in the FBI. And lo and behold, one of the things that uh, you have to do to become a member of the FBI is go through the FBI Academy. The, there was a problem. The problem was that women were failing at higher rates. Women and minorities were failing at higher rates than were the men. No surprise, right? So when you think about a class of, uh, class of FBI agents, if you saw Silence of the Lambs, all of you remember that, Jodie Foster at the FBI Academy, typically there would be just a few women in an FBI class of maybe 100 and something men. And if you think about um, a few women, there might even be one African American woman or one Hispanic woman among the two or three or five women there. Think about the pressure of uh, being in, in, in that sort of an environment for a three a month period of time with people expecting you to get along just because you were females in that type of environment. Uh, so the FBI was uh, an occasion for me to not only work on issues like that but also work on at that time the um, uh, Wayne Williams case was going on, the Atlantic kidnapping case was going on. Uh, we had the Libyan hit squad uh, so in 1981, when I was a White House fellow, that, that's when the barriers, if you go down to the White House, you see all those barriers around the White House, and the, the, they went up that year when people talked about the Libyan hit squad. And I mean, to me, that's interesting. I mean, we, we kind of forget about the fact that uh, our capital was an open place and the barriers weren't around the White House. But that experience at the, uh, uh, at the White House fellows program really uh, crystallize my commitment to work in state government. Now let me just tell you about my other background. I have my doctorate from the Ed School, my area is organizational behavior. So I did my thesis on black women in blue collar factory jobs. And what I was interested in was what is it that creates people's perception of opportunity? How do women gain opportunity or, or positions in jobs, particularly in non-traditional work? And this expertise or this interest really took me into General Motors uh, in 1982 after I'd left the White House Fellows and I stayed in the, at the uh, General Motors from 1982 to 1987 in which I uh, left there in 87. I took the buyout. I was one of the high, I was the highest ranking black woman at General Motors before I left. I left as a director of uh, General Motors, director of placement in college relation. But what's interesting about my path at General Motors is that my commitment, my interest is in manufacturing and engineering. I joined General Motors in order to become a plant manager, to build cars, and, uh, <laughs> to, uh, and I ended up, like I think a lot of women do in the business area, I ended up in personnel. Uh, so the, one of the things that um, I wanted to want to say to you tonight, that I think that there are some skills that women need to have in order to be successful. And one of the skills that, I, that, that really are important is to think about the whole area of systems. You've heard the concept systems and systems thinking. And I think in order to be uh, successful, uh, to be able to see things from a holistic point of view is a skill that women need to develop. I think that women also need to develop the skill of managing ambiguity or managing an environment where there's chaos or ambiguity because there is no cause and effect. There's no black and white. There are no easy answers. And the questions and the problems that are coming at us are problems in which we need to be able to uh, operate, uh, operate in an environment of, that's complex and uh, amb uh, ambiguous. Also, 
we need to have a moral compass, a moral compass in terms of what are our values and beliefs. Because on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, and certainly in my job, decisions are coming at me. I have lobbyists approaching me. I have politicians. I have constituents. I have a whole realm of people that want something from me as secretary. What's my moral compass? What is it that I believe in? What are, what are my particular convictions? What is it that holds me true and fast? And what holds me true and fast is my commitment to, I believe that people should be treated with dignity and respect. I believe everybody has an opportunity or should have an opportunity to contribute. I believe that everybody makes a unique contribution and I think that everybody should have the highest quality of life that they can. And I'm absolutely committed to that, econ that goal for citizens of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And that's my moral compass on a day to day. I think that uh, in terms of uh, that women should really know that there's a difference between leadership and management. And I don't mean, I think when I had this course at the Ed School, we used to talk about is education an art or a craft. I don't mean like that. I mean there is a difference between leadership and management. And leaders provide a vision, they provide an aim, they provide a, a purpose to an organization which ties into the whole purpose of systems. One of the things that I had an opportunity to do is, tell me how am I doing? Uh, two to three minutes. Uh, uh, one of the things I had an opportunity to do at, in state government that I'm very proud of is to work on domestic violence. Um, when, I became, when I was assistant secretary uh, uh, in public safety, which was my first job in state government when I joined in March 3rd, uh, three years ago, the, there was legislation on the books which required each police department to report crimes and to develop a domestic violence policy. And that was really all that we really needed to do, was to ensure that our 350 cities and towns uh, developed the domestic violence policy and to provide some training. I was very committed and am committed to the issue of domestic violence. And I began to look and to build networks um, uh, in state government, battered women's shelters, uh, domestic uh, people that were um, batterers treatment program, people in education, DYS, all of the various groups. And what I did was begin to take a systems approach. If we wanted to prevent domestic violence, how do we create a safety net net for victims of domestic violence so that they don't fall through the cracks. And what's in place now is the Governor's Commission on Domestic Violence, which is chaired by the Lieutenant Governor. And I think it's a very unusual task force, or a very unusual commission, because it is expansive and because it brings together a very diverse group of people, state police officers, judges with the batterers treatment. That is a one-of-a-kind commission. Uh, luckily in this state we have experts like Sarah Buell and Stacy Cabot who you probably saw on the Academy Awards last night because uh, we won the, uh, 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 you know, the, the Oscar for the short subject on domestic violence for the Framingham yeah. Eight. And um, uh, I think that, that is a really something for us to be proud of here in Massachusetts. So wh um, I, what, what I care about is from my background, what I care about and what I bring to the party to bring to state government is the whole notion, obviously, of, of including people. And that's by virtue of me being uh, Secretary of Consumer Affairs and Business Regulation, I can combine my business expertise, my commitment to scholarship and continuous learning, and my commitment to the citizens of the Commonwealth. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Sonia. Um, first of all, it's great being back here. Uh, I see a lot of friends in the audience. And uh, I have to admit that uh, one of the main reasons I'm here is uh, because Amy Sandler invited me. And uh, she spent quite a bit of time on the phone with me. Um, <laughs> because as usual, I was overcommitted for this week. and. Um, uh, I had to get out of a couple of other things to make the trip, and I just wanted to tell Amy I appreciated her patience in uh, working this out. Um, I guess I'm going to come at things just a little bit uh, differently. Uh, uh, for starters, I think I've benefited from the kind of experiences you've heard already uh, tonight. Um, I started uh, college in 1973. Uh, in the midst of the women's movement. Uh, it was a very exciting time to be going to college. And uh, uh, I think 
one of the things that was very clear at that point was that the message was you could do whatever you wanted. Well, that was a confusing message because I didn't have a clue. Um, I, my <laughs> mother uh, had uh, uh, done um, the traditional thing of staying at home and raising children. Um, the only difficulty was that it was in the environment of a military base because my father was in the military. Uh, so we traveled all over the, the country and the world. Um, and I saw from her example uh, the importance of, of sacrifice and, and uh, commitment to an ideal. Um, but I also saw uh, after my folks got divorced that I didn't want to go through what she went through. And so uh, that had a lot to do with my motivation of making sure that whatever I decided to do, I would be independent. Um, I had a uh, high school English teacher. I went to three different high schools, and this was my last high school. And um, I remembered that uh, at that time, I was confused as to whether I would go into law or, or into medicine or to do something else. And uh, I think one of the reasons I wanted to go into medicine is that my brother was going into medicine. Um, uh, and I had been keep competing against him for years, and why stop now? Uh, <laughs> but but this, this teacher, uh, and, and I really uh, do appreciate what she said to me at the time, she said, well, Sonny, you could, you could go into medicine. Uh, you could do a lot of things uh, if you put your mind to it. Um, but uh, why are you going to do something that doesn't come as natural to you as the things you like to do? You like to talk to people. You like to interact with people. You like to argue. Um, you like to write, uh, and of course you like to talk. So uh, why are you thinking just of medicine when uh, law and some of the other things, especially politics that you've talked about, seem to be a more natural fit? And um, as I was going through college, I remembered that conversation on a number of occasions because I was still very attracted to uh, science and, and uh, the so-called hard sciences. Whereas political science and psychology and communications, they were easy. I mean, I was making A's in the class, and, and, and I should have been challenged. Uh, at least I thought so at the time. Um, but when it came time to uh, uh, figure out what I was going to do after college, uh, and this was out at, at Stanford, uh, I decided to take a year off because I'd been in such a hurry to get on with my life, even though I still didn't have a clue. Um, and so during that, that time out, I uh, played in a rock band, and it was probably the best thing I did um, <laughs> because I learned uh, how to uh, keep appointments, how to get to a gig on time. <laughs> um, I was the only woman. Uh, the, the other musicians were men, and I learned how to deal in their very arcane way of speaking about things. Um, and that, I think, really... Uh, I think built upon a couple of the other things I learned while I was in college, and that is um, uh, one of the ways I made extra money uh, was playing poker with the guys <laughs> late at night. And uh, one of the reasons I was successful is they never knew if I was bluffing or not. Um, it's an important skill. It is. <laughs> uh, the other thing was um, uh, being captain of the Stanford basketball team. Um, which was, uh, again, one of the, the more fun things I had a chance to do. Not so much uh, uh, in light of the subsequent success of the Cardinal, but because when I got there, we, uh, the women had to play in a little rinky-dink gym. Um, we had to wear pennies. We didn't have uniforms. I never did like pennies. And, <laughs> and if nothing else, I was determined that before we left, we were not going to wear pennies. Um, Oh, those little, little things tip. you pulled over your head and had the little number on it? You didn't have a jersey. You oh. had the, yeah. So we ended up, uh, a, a couple of uh, members of the team ended up ch uh, challenging the administration, threatening a Title IX lawsuit. Um, <laughs> and eventually we got uniforms. We got practice time in Maples Pavilion, where they play today. Uh, and then our final coup was actually being able to play before the men's games, because they were scheduling our games whenever the men didn't need the gym. Um, now it's just so nice to see that the, the women's games 
are out selling the men's games. And uh, we feel that, <laughs> that that's coming full circle. Um, after uh, I decided that, that I, I was going to be a musician for life, but not necessarily for money, uh, I went to law school at Yale Law School. It's been in the news a lot lately. A um, number of friends of mine uh, uh, are involved in government and academia. Um, and uh, learned a lot there about, again, competing uh, at the Ivy League level. Um, and I think what helped was I wasn't overly impressed with it, so that it, it, I never did feel intimidated. Um, I had a um, a uh, professor who's still at Yale, so I won't mention his name, um, who uh, I think enjoyed trying to catch me when I was not prepared for class, which was not very often, uh, even though I did not appear to be ready for class. Uh, 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 so one day, uh, I had this penchant for writing notes uh, to my colleagues because I didn't think it was polite to you know, talk. Uh, in class. Uh, some of those notes I could make some money off of now, but I won't. Uh, uh, but in any event, on this particular day, uh, a piece of paper flew out of my hand and went wafting down the aisle. And the professor just knew he had me this time. Um, and he uh, uh, demanded that I come down, pick it up, and, and read to the class what I, I had been writing. And this was the only day in three years there was nothing on that piece of paper. Uh, I learned from that, always be prepared for the unexpected. Um, <laughs> and that served me well uh, in the type of work I do now. Um, after clerking for a judge uh, in Montgomery, Alabama, uh, one of those uh, places of history that I encourage all of you to go to at some point, um, I then uh, did not immediately go into public service. I ended up uh, going to a law firm, uh, which didn't work very long, mainly because um, I could not understand why the law firm wasn't concerned about people and the substance of the law. Uh, they were concerned about billable hours and uh, how hard they could work me. Uh, so uh, after a couple years of that, I decided to uh, get into the academic setting. I enjoyed that. Um, it was a lot of fun. Um, and it also led me to the kind of work I'm doing now. A lot of times people ask me, what am I doing now? And, and it takes me a while to explain. But it's a combination of, of uh, advocacy work, uh, media, uh, uh, on both sides, uh, producing and being the subject of media. Uh, it's public policy analysis, it's legal work with law firms uh, as well as practitioners. Um, and a lot of that, uh, again, to, to pick up on a couple points that were made earlier, there wasn't any particular career path I was following. It was much more trying to be true uh, to that inner voice. And I think that's what all of us have been trying to okay. say in our own different ways, that there is no one way, there is no one size fits all. And uh, you don't have to do it the hard way if what you're doing uh, comes naturally and it, and it feels right to you. Um, those are some of the, I think, the more important uh, messages I'd like to pass on today. Um, and I know that from my own personal experience that uh, as long as you feel that you're doing something positive and productive, uh, uh, even if you don't feel that you're always being compensated for it, uh, <laughs> uh, it's OK, because that is what keeps you going. Um, and those are some of the things that I've tried to continue to do uh, as I've uh, come back to teaching. I've enjoyed that, and I hope to do that again in the future. Um, but also, I'm now trying to uh, spread out a little bit more in terms of writing, and, and that's my way of finding my own voice. Uh, uh, I think that uh, uh, sometimes, uh, and I'm sure some of you have had this experience, when you sit at home and you might be flipping the TV, uh, looking at other folks talking and struggling, and you say, well, I can do that. And the answer to that is, yes, you can. Uh, you don't have to wait for uh, the so-called leaders uh, to tell you uh, what to think or what to do. Instead, uh, all too often in Washington, I find that, that the leaders are waiting for you to tell them what to do, um, uh, which takes me back uh, to my concluding point. Um, <laughs> 
to, to something uh, my mother taught me many years ago, and that was lead, follow, or get out of the way. And I think uh, that's a message that you can all use as well as you start out uh, developing your own careers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. Okay. Well, <laughs> I have the dubious task of, <laughs> of finishing this discussion, at least at this level, after these um, extremely fine and articulate and very special women um, have spoken about their own experience and the ingredients that, that, that each of them has discussed that have led to their place in the world today, I share much of. Um, and I know that many of you in this audience do as well. I um, guess that I would like to start a bit on the personal side uh, because my own path haphazard as it has been, uh, really began with, a deeply, with deeply personal experiences that I won't elaborate too precisely, except to say that um, the personal experiences I had uh, as a woman who started out life um, believing that my basic uh, value in the world would be to uh, to be a mother, be a wife, and um, I planned to have an education, and, and, and I was too energetic and had too much of a vision not to pursue an educational career, but really, in fact, that was always in the 60s um, when I married as a junior at the university. Um, that came second or third or fourth or fifth, and so I had to fit my own evolution my own development, my own personal development into the, the career of my husband and my role as a, a mother um, because I had children very young um, and uh, very soon after I was married. So I had many experiences along the way to these very, um, um, to my career that said to me that, and it didn't, it took, a, it took a brick hitting me over the head, I must admit, to finally help me understand how women were positioned so differently uh, in the world. But I remember uh, applying for graduate school, and there was some discussion about whether married women were prime graduate potential, because why should you go to graduate school? You're just going to be mothers, I mean truly this, now remember this was in the 60s and um, I grew up in the 50s as a woman whose again vision about life was to have um, children and be married and have a home life, which by the way I value very much, but I had other ideas. I think it took my, my uh, a very sudden divorce and um, uh, a pregnancy that uh, I decided had to be terminated and had to go through a very traumatic abortion experience before it was legal for me to confront the oppression of women. And also being put into a situation where I was suddenly thrust into being the sole and utter support of my family, my three young daughters, uh, and being very scared about how to do that, uh, I had enormously um, difficult personal obstacles to overcome. First, to think of myself as having some skills and, and worth that was marketable. But when you have three children whose lives depend solely on you, you manage somehow to do what it takes to put their lives together. And so what I did is I hearkened back to my own uh, early life. I was always a person who was sort of outside the systems. We've talked about people being inside the systems. I always, in high school, and uh, I was always outside the system, sort of challenging the status quo, whether it was in high school. Um, I found myself as an advocate in some way, shape, or form, as a person who liked to organize, to make things happen. I was not always fondly 
appreciated by <laughs> uh, the schools. I, I remember organizing a, a petition drive to improve or to call attention to the poor education that we were getting in this little high school I was in. <laughs> and I was suspended for three days. But I'll tell you, the students were fabulous. They really got into this. And we really did make a difference. You know, we were suspended um, <laughs> uh, for three days. But never mind. Anyway, my life has always been, or at least as I thought about what I was going to do in the world, there were obvious things that drove me. Um, I cared about equality uh, for all people. I, I don't want to sound cliche here, but I was always deeply disturbed by the inequality I saw around me. And I was always part trying to change systems. And so as I thought about my own career, um, I was trained in child development work. And I cared very deeply about children. And I started my life, um, my personal uh, career, working in the area of child development, uh, creating programs for children and their families. And that coincided with my interest in women, especially after my personal experiences, that I saw that if I could translate my concern for children and women into change, um, uh, changing societal attitudes and structures, I could make an enormous contribution. Um, so I started in child development work and found that enormously satisfying, but it also enormously frustrating. Um, as I saw the really rather lackadaisical approach to child development, saw rather um, custodial daycare programs. And one of the things that I did was to change, take over a daycare program and change it from a purely custodial to a real developmental center. Okay. From that, uh, I, I became uh, a coordinator of early childhood programs on a large scale and really had an impact on uh, improving the, the quality of the programs for children, valuing teachers. Um, I, one of the things I'm most proud of is the fact that I conceived of and developed and implemented a multi diagnostic, therapeutic, interdisciplinary treatment program for developmentally disabled children and their families. What I saw for children was a very fragmented approach to treating children's specific problems. That children's, the approach was a very fragmented, um, send a child over here for this problem and over here for that problem, never seeing the child wholly and, and the child within the family system. It drove me crazy. And again, as a person who always wants to try to change systems, I actually created a program that integrated the disciplines into one program and really took the child and treated the pieces within the context of the whole child. And I integrated you know, psychiatry, psychology, speech and language pathology, um, 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 specialties of of child development, family therapists, all in one program. I wrote a grant, I wrote a proposal to the Bureau, what was known then as the Bureau of Education for the Handicap. Yeah. The thing I never wrote for so much in my life. It was about this thick. Now you write proposals, they don't want to read more than two pages. But this was, I tell you, it took me months to write this thing. But it was a very detailed elaboration of the goals and the principles and then the program. And I got funding for three years and established this um, um, exper not experimental, model program, and proved that with a comprehensive, integrated, holistic, intensive approach, you could really make a difference. However, having done that, um, the, more, the more I worked with children, the more I became concerned about the women, the single moms of which I was one for a long time. And I'll tell you, one of the worst positions in society in this country is to be a poor, single mom. It is a horrible situation to find yourself in. And this society does not help. And I became more and more concerned that all the intervention in the world that I was helping to shape and lead and craft for the children was really was, was important. And once the children are here, you got to do that. But if I could 
make a difference for women and their choices and change the social, political, economic conditions that women find themselves making decisions within, perhaps that would have also an impact on children's lives. So I could do both. I left my program. Uh, actually, the grant ended. <laughs> That's a, well, one way to move on. And, um, and I, I, I specifically looked for work where I could work on behalf of women. And I was offered a position as executive director of Planned Parenthood, a large Planned Parenthood affiliate in Pennsylvania. By the way, there's a lot of hops along the way here. But anyway, um, and I took over this struggling affiliate. Um, and again, my goal was to really change the way we thought about reproductive health. And when I took over this affiliate, in fact, it wasn't even a Planned Parenthood then, I affiliated with Planned Parenthood, it offered contraceptive services. And by the time I left, it offered prenatal care, infertility services, genetic screening, sexually transmissible diseases testing and treatment, contraceptive care, and we were working on abortion services. Again, a holistic approach so that women, especially low-income women, whom we served primarily, about 20,000 of them, would have the full range of options and programs to choose from. Served a lot of teenagers. Two minutes. Okay. Two minutes. <laughs> I, I think that the thing that I have been driven by all my life has been a passion for whatever I believed in. And I believe that whatever work you do, if you have a passionate um, belief in what you're doing, uh, the work will be interesting and will be rewarding. And I do think leadership is different from management. Um, I think leadership is inspiration. It's having a vision. It's being able to, to inspire people, whether it's individual, an individual or a group of people, to go beyond what they ever thought they could ever accomplish. And my job at NARAL has been to give voice to a very, for some people, very difficult issue, but do it in a way that people can hear you and to inspire a group of people that I work with who are not paid a lot to accomplish a great deal in a hostile environment and to, to move forward with a vision. But I think if you have passion, you know what you're about, don't be You've heard this a couple of times. My, my view is that you shouldn't be too rigid or, or, or fixated you should, on what it is you're going to do when maybe women are, as Kim said, and a number of us said, we, we have less of a, a, a real focus than men uh, about where we're ultimately going to end up. If we can be flexible, be open to trying the new experiences, take from them the richness of that experience it will mold itself into a whole for you. And you will become um, what you want to become. And I think it is harder for some of you than it is, was for me. I had a pretty set, set of ex expectations, and I had to break through those. You now have more choices. And sometimes I see my three grown daughters struggling with how to manage their own self-development and careers and their personal lives. It's hard, but you can do it if you don't expect yourselves to be superwomen. That's pretty hard to do, too. Um, and to just be patient with yourselves, but to believe in yourselves. Thank you. Well, I think this was a wonderful series of presentations. I'm going to resist the urge to immediately offer a series of comments myself because I want to involve you and uh, give you a chance to ask questions. Uh, you can direct them to someone in particular, or I will direct them. And there are mics on either side of the room. Uh, any questions for any, anyone? Yes. Hi. Um, hi. My name is Melissa Liazis. I'm a member of the Student Advisory Committee here at the IOP. Um, I'm also on the executive board of the Women's Leadership Project, which was mentioned at the beginning of this. Um, one of the issues that we try to adjust, address at the Women's Leadership Project every year is 
whether or not men and women have inherently different styles of leadership. And mm -hmm. I just wanted to hear thoughts from the panelists on whether or not you thought that was true, and if so, in what way? I, I, would, I, I my experience, my experience is that we do have slightly different styles of leadership. I have a vice president of NARAL who is now leading the organization, very strong man, very political, come from out of the political world. Um, and our, I mean, this is a small example, but as I watch his style versus mine, and as I've watched over the years, um, men and women, different, the differences, I think there are some some interesting differences. One is that, from my experience, mm -hmm. women tend to be more uh, participatory, if you will. Not that we're not decision makers. So I'm a strong decision maker. But I do it in a way that makes everybody at the end feel they participated in the decision where I think sometimes, not, I don't think you can generalize, and I think there's a danger in generalizing. I think there is less concern and patience for that, perhaps, with some men that I have seen in terms of management. Um, I, again, you don't want to generalize, but I think our styles are, are more uh, generalized, right? <laughs> can I? Can I yes. Yeah. Because I, I think there is a difference. I just let me give you two, two quick anecdotes. When I was, sp I was speaking over at Radcliffe a few weeks ago and talking at a symposium on violence and on how as Attorney General I had dealt with the very difficult issue of gun control legislation, which is extremely contentious in Canada, and I had brought forward some very sweeping changes to our criminal code. And I was ex describing the process that I had used to bring people on side and to be inclusive and, uh, mm. uh, and, and the, the, how I'd manage the political process. And which was unusual, and, and people did not expect that I was going to succeed. Everybody thought I was going to get you know, run over by a juggernaut, and instead, in fact, I got the legislation through. And after I finished Alice Wolf, who had been uh, a counselor in Cambridge for 20 years, Mayor of Cambridge, you know, it's so interesting. There's exactly the process that we used to deal with a very difficult uh, issue in our community. And I think it's a much more uh, female style of approach. For many years, women were not considered good leadership or good management material because they were not strong enough, they were not hierarchical enough, and tended to be too consultative and whatever, you know, not kind of too wimpy. And then people began to notice that some of our major industrial competitors had management structures in their corporations that were not terribly Being hierarchical and us, consultative. Right. And, and <laughs> all of a sudden, this became a very desirable form of management. It got written up in articles in That's the Harvard right. Business Review. But I think it's something that, that women have done. And I dislike this notion of, you know, women are better than men, and you right. know, if women lead, right. run the world, we'd have more truth, beauty, and justice. What we would have is a world that was more reflected the people who live in it. Um, I don't assume virtue on the part of women, and it may be that those management styles are a reflection of the fact that we didn't grow up uh, able to be assertive and forthright and hierarchical and, and, and pushy. Uh, uh, I, but I, I think the result is, in fact, <laughs> often very effective, and I have seen it in the political process accomplish things and get places that more traditional styles of leadership could not do. I think but you can be assertive without being, though, authoritarian. And I think when I talk about how to, how to use power and authority is sometimes different between men and women, mm -hmm. often different. Mm -hmm. And I think what Kim is saying, what I'm trying to say, is that, um, that we do approach things more from a communal basis and, and want to bring people into the decision rather than, you know, an authoritarian, uh, you, get, you get the same result, I think, but uh, different. But I think assertiveness <laughs> is becoming more of a watchword. And speaking of which, um, I'm going to be inclusive <laughs> but decisive. You want to say something and then we're going to move to another question. Um, I think, um, you know, I think w instead of trying to look at the issues, are, are women different or have a different leadership style than, than do men? Uh, I'm concerned to, into where that argument is going in terms of mm -hmm. providing some limitations for women in terms of their leadership style. I think that business and government, I think organizations are changing so rapidly that the skill mix that's required to, to be successful for, 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 for men and for women is, is being determined. 
and I think it's fluid. And um, you know, when you look at what's, how have women influenced the whole discussion about uh, about leadership, I think. That's an interesting question, that we have, in fact, influenced the discussion with leadership. As you look at men looking at their uh, feminine side or uh, whatever, dancing with wolves, there's a whole, whatever the stuff is going on, there's a whole dynamic that's going on where people are looking at their relationships. So when I think about leadership, one of the definitions that I use is it's the management, the management of relationships to the achievement of mutually beneficial goals. Um, the management of relationships. I think that's very different as people think about how do you manage relationships to the achievement of mutually beneficial goals because that encompasses the fact that it is um, that is organic and our organizations and our institutions are being viewed as more organic as opposed to uh, structural, which requires different skills. Thanks. Thank you. Yes. Hi, my name is Shemen Keitner and I'm a junior at the college. My mother's at home in Ottawa. She's at the Director of Research for the Canadian Advisory Council on the Status of Women. Oh, and I think yeah. that that institution, as well as this panel, is really founded on the presupposition of gender as a fundamental category of experience. But I know that you don't need to know much history to know that there are also other categories of experience, like race, ethnicity, nationality, class, that have often really undermined the solidarity of womanhood. And I'm wondering what experiences you have had dealing with those different forces that can be very divisive, potentially, but that ultimately do need to be overcome for feminism really to work as a movement and to make changes in society. Really well, I'll, I'll take that on. Yeah. Um, um, in fact, I started to, to talk a little bit about uh, uh, problems of race versus uh, uh, problems of sex discrimination, mm. uh, which was worse, which had I felt more. I don't think it really matters uh, I, in, in this sense that if you're being discriminated against for any reason, it's not allowing you to reach your full potential. Um, and so I've spent a lot of my professional life addressing just those very issues. How do we teach uh, those who come behind us, the importance of celebrating our differences as opposed to being afraid of them. Um, but we don't often get to that point because it's much easier not to address these issues and instead to fall back on uh, those common or comfortable cliches. Um, uh, I could tell you a number of incidents I, I faced as a a young woman, uh, a number I faced as a black person, uh, a, a few that I think were unique to a black woman. Uh, but I, again, that isn't going to stop me from doing what it is I need to do, and that is to try and reach out and communicate to others uh, about the issues of equality and equal opportunity, uh, not only in, in terms of voting, but a, across the board. Um, if we allow ourselves to be divided, uh, that's the easiest way to stop any real progressive Progress. movement, right? Okay. Isn't that uh, usually the case? And, and the thing I think if you, if you study the area is that it doesn't really matter if we're talking about the nation state or the boardroom, uh, that the same tactics work across the board. Uh, and it's on the, the part of those who have been victimized in the past to turn that around. Uh, I mean, we were talking earlier about uh, uh, aggression versus assertiveness and, and that type of thing. But, but related to that, I think, is that if you allow yourself to think as a victim, you will be treated as a victim. And part of what, what we try to do in our own individual ways is to encourage you and the rest of the audience not to think of yourself as a victim and to recognize that you have the power to transcend those barriers. You're welcome. Could I Thank you. Yes, I think we're all um, more than well schooled in uh, qualities and uh, things in our lives that divide us or keep us apart. But we very, very seldom bring up the divisiveness, economic divisiveness. Poverty is a big factor in whether or not you will ever succeed. It will have a great deal to do with what your education is going to be. 
it doesn't make a lot of sense to take children out of homes, as Kate pointed out, and even perhaps put them in a decent school for a couple of hours and then throw them back into households and housing and what we used to call ghettos, where they drown for the other you know, 20 hours in a day. A very wise woman I know said to me one time that the longest journey is blue collar to white collar. And then I, I think gender comes second, and race comes at, you know, second, and other. I think what we do not face up to in this country is the great economic divide caused by economic disparities. Thank you. I think we are over here for a question. Yeah. Some of you have talked about the um, challenges faced in managing a career as well as a family. And I'd like to hear a little bit more about that, some of the challenges that you faced. Um, especially, um, I'd be interested in hearing if somebody took some time off from work and then was interested in re-entering the workforce. And what does that um, do as far as career issues and choices? Anybody want to? Well, I'll tell you what it was like in the, in the ancient times. <laughs> uh, uh, there, were, there was no daycare. <laughs> there was no home care. You found someone. I hate to tell you, but. <laughs> found someone to we come. We haven't progressed too much. Yeah, stay in the house. Uh, I myself found a woman who would come by the day and take care of the children, and she did so for 17 years. She did it not because she was wonderful or I was wonderful, but because I divided my pay three ways. A third to her, a third to the government, and a third to me. Uh, like Kate, I basically raised three children for many years by myself. Um, I think that, uh, I, could I ask questions? Of, I don't understand where all of the fire has gone. There was more passion 20 years ago on these issues in the United States <laughs> than there is now. now. Which issues are you referring to? Daycare. Uh, equal pay for jobs of equal worth, which Canada right. managed to decipher and enact a law. Do you know when we got a uh, guarantee, federal legal guarantee for you to be able to take some time off to stay home with a child in the United States? Just last year. Last 1993. Year. Where, where is everybody on these issues? What has happened to the drive for something we used to call social justice? Not mm -hmm. just gender justice, but so social justice. And, and I'd really like to know, I would really like to know, where is everybody in this room right now, this group of educated, advantaged, privileged, beautiful, strong, brilliant <laughs> women, why aren't you all standing up on your hind legs screaming over the very, very unfair and terrible treatment that is being paid to our first lady? She's one of us. She's one of you. And everyone sits around and just decides it's a matter of simple politics or, or uh, today's fad or something like that. I don't understand. I'd love to know, what do you think of these things? What do you have to say to us as well as we to you? I think that's an important point. Yeah, it has okay. a lot to do with why it's so important yeah. to have women in positions of decision making. And we're not all going to agree. And one of the things we have to stop doing to ourselves is putting a litmus test on the womanhood yeah. of women. No man is ever seen as a betrayer of his sex. Yeah. Uh, I, mean, it's just, I, mean, I mean, if you said, now the problem with Bill Clinton, you know, I mean, he's just letting down America, and you go, oh, man. Uh, and yet that, women in public life, that is the extra burden that you bear. Yeah. And the first thing you have to say is, first of all, we are not all alike. We are not all going to agree on everything. Yeah. We are not. There are a lot of ways to get from A to B, and some of us are left wing, and some of us are right wing, and we have different paradigms which understand the world. But the one thing I can tell you, the world has been organized by men. And it's not a plot, and it's not a war of the sexes. It's the simple fundamental fact that if you're not there talking about your reality, People won't understand it. And whether it's the tax laws, whether it's, it's the price You know, when I had, mm -hmm. I hosted the first ever national symposium on women law and the administration of justice in Canada in June of 1991. And we also, we, we talked mostly about the justice system. We also got into things like taxation. But it was very interesting to me how many judges said to me, you know, before this conference, I thought I was pretty liberal on these issues. And I realized I didn't know anything. Mm. And they were so grateful, most of them. 
for having a chance actually to hear. And if you're not there, if you're silent, if your voice isn't being heard, then you're going to get social policy and economic policy and fiscal policy and taxation structures that work against your interests. And I think it's very, very, I think part of the problem too is that it's so hard to get into public life that a lot of women who do get there either have had it fairly easy because they've got the financial resources or they just you know, are overwhelmed because there's so few of them with the, with the ability right. to carry the women's agenda. But there's, there's a lot of different ways. One can argue about what the best way is to provide health care. I come from a country which does it one way. You may want to do it different. There's a lot of arguments about the best just way like to, to provide care for children. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, but let's get it, on the, but get it on the agenda, make it an issue, and let women be out there also fighting it out in the political arena about what the best way is to yeah. allocate our public resources. And, that and, is just crucial. And here in Massachusetts, I mean, I think you know that in our cabinet, in the, and we have the most women in uh, state government in this cabinet than any other state in the country. Yep. I mean, so there were a lot of women for you to talk to uh, on education, on labor, on an environmental I issues, on education. Uh, for me, in consumer affairs and business regulation, we are all there. Uh, there's a women's commission uh, that, that the governor has charged. We have an Asian commission. We have a Hispanic commission. We have an African American commission. We have a gay and lesbian commission. So there's very many, there's many avenues for, for your voices to be heard at the state level. Okay, Can let me, you want to say one well, thing and then I, I'm going to take I, another well, question. I, just, I don't think we, <laughs> we really <laughs> answered, I, the question. I answered the question just simply to say that there is no easy answer. The, the world, as Kim has said, is organized by men and men's standards and, and structures um, and needs. And women are confronted with when having a family, having two very serious full-time, more than full-time jobs. Challenge for you is to be a part of change in this society that says no more. We're going to we're going to share response. We're going to change the structure so that women and men are more partners in this um, uh, in this childbearing. I mean, this is a vision. In the meantime, childbearing, <laughs> child, well, it's a vision. We've got to change it because women are being forced to take lower paying jobs, to being forced to sacrifice their careers um, and the things that they want to do because they have to be caretakers of their family, children, raisers of their children, and they want to do that successfully. There has to be change, and until there is, you are going to be, it's, it's a terrible dilemma that women are faced with is how to meet all the yeah. needs. There's no question. I see my daughter who has two children, who is a professor who can't, who can't, who has had to make a choice. The husband's not made a choice. He is teaching, he does, and he's wonderful. I don't mean, he just, but she, <laughs> she's had to make a choice, and he doesn't. So there's no easy way. All I can say is if it's going to be different for your children, perhaps, daughters, <laughs> We are going to have to collectively work to change the system. And I think that men, a lot of men are taking more responsibility, but the system is the same. We are expected to, to give it up. Yeah, I think there's one other thing. <laughs> Just uh, one other thing in, th in terms of there's another model. It's not women, in, uh, women going in and out of the workforce, taking time yeah. off to have yeah. children. Yeah. It's women that have never been married and don't have children like me who, who characterize many of my friends. So there is so, and we all know that women um, marry at a later age and raise yeah. children at a later age. So there is a whole new model out there. But many of us have made um, have made a choice, another choice, which is to, at, at, at my age to be single and not married and not have children and to and to work. And I think the issue. I have to say something here. The issue <laughs> is also at a decision making level around looking at what is model. What is your model of success? Um, and what is the model of success that is perpetuated by career, career ladders, practices and policies by organizations, and what gets rewarded and what doesn't. And not only just making individual choice, but working to create policies and practices that are flexible and sensitive to the wide variety of needs, lifestyles, choices that women make across the lifespan. Um, and that, to me, is, I think, the more complex part of the uh, policy changing the policy in the system, as, as, as you're saying. OK, shall we move over here? Hi, my name is Eve Kaplan. I'm a junior at the college. And um, 
I'm wondering why, when I've seen women rise to major, major political positions in a lot of different countries, like the premier positions, you know, Canada, England, the Philippines, for example, That's why right. this has not happened in the United States? Like, do you think it's something about our political system or our culture or um, what's it all about? Whether we're just more sexist than some of these other <laughs> countries. Okay, yeah, yeah let's uh -oh. take some. Yeah, I think what the question you have asked is key. We are an older democracy than some of the countries, most of the countries, who have elected women to the highest office. It is a very interesting question. Why? We, cannot, we can't even elect one to the second highest office. Janet Reno becoming attorney general has, is shocking to many people still in this country. And again, I point out to you, the New York Times doesn't like her very much and didn't like her appointment either. That's right. And I, I just think that that is central. I think that we, in the United States, I've thought about this. I think we made a decision sometime post-World War II. While Europe and Canada, India, Israel was coming along, decided to move along a course of sort of social, socialized democracy. We reverted to rugged individualism, the old rugged individualism. We stayed stuck in the Cold War with, with, with Russia. Now you, think, you may think that that's an obscure answer, but think about it afterward. We decided to fight to militarize, to have big weaponry, to not put the money into social development in this country. And I really think that the root of our having so few women in government and in high positions has to do with that basic decision concerning the Cold War. Well, okay, I'd like yes, to sir. add to that, um, which is, I think it, it is related to this issue of socialization mm. we were talking about before and that, uh, a lot of people, and I say people uh, on purpose, have trouble visualizing women in certain roles. Mm. And the ones who are the pioneers are so hammered by the process uh, that uh, those coming right behind aren't always anxious to jump to into follow. that same uh, uh, boiling pit, if you will. And, and I think the, the type of things we're hearing about Janet Reno, uh, about uh, Hillary Clinton, um, mm. Uh, Carol Mosley Braun, I mean, the, the list goes on. There's a different level of expectation, and that's the type of thing we have to attack, uh, not only in terms of our media institution. But her question is why? Oh, and, and I'm yeah. getting to that. It just yes. takes me a little while. Um, uh, if we look at uh, the problem of money and politics, for example, we know if you're going to run for uh, the Congress, you need at least a half a million dollars. If you're going to run for Senate in a small state, you need at least $2 million. Uh, that is a lot of money for people to raise. And, and the pattern so far has been for women who have been successful uh, at the state level, they have had to demonstrate that they can take care of money, the treasurers, the comptrollers. Uh, they've been able to move up to that next level. Uh, but we haven't seen that across the board, even though we're seeing greater numbers of women in the state legislature, mm -hmm. it's harder to make that step. And then finally, another factor that relates back to the last question we had, it's the personal price. Too many women who do go into politics pay a personal price in terms of their private relations. Uh, and they find that the scrutiny, that, uh, the scrutiny that Geraldine Ferraro received, I still think was criminal. But it happened and it sent a message and other women looked at what happened to her and said, I, I can't do that to my family. Right. So that's also related uh, to this whole mm -hmm. issue of having different expectations and different pressures as you're trying to decide, I'm going to make politics my life. OK. I have the uh, awful burden of having to bring this to a close. Um, I'm sorry we can't take everyone's questions, but the formally we need to thank you all for coming. Thank our panelists. I don't think we could have had a more eloquent and articulate group of women to address the complexities of issues in women and developing themselves as leaders, finding their voices, and create, making a difference in the world. And I want to thank you all for coming this evening.
been instructed to tell you if you'd like to stay and still ask questions, even though formally the program's over, we're here for as long as you would like us.